Amen. What's interesting, this topic this week, a lot of times as I'm writing this sermon, I'll put, uh, find an opening illustration. And I'll go ahead and kind of work on the sermon. I'll come back. I came back around last night. And uh, sometimes when I do that, you know, I'm looking for maybe a joke or a story or a relevant video. And I'll Google the, the sermon topic to get a, an idea. But somehow last night, as I was looking at this, I said, you know, I'm not feeling led to Google this because <laughs> I don't know what will... Um, so, so just... Tell a story at lunch as far as the opening illustration, if we get out two minutes early because of that. Yeah, that would be a miracle. All right, so as we get started here, there's good news and there's bad news. And as we dive in this morning, want to start with the bad news, but be reminded that whenever there's what we might call serious or bad news, there's always good news when Jesus Christ is involved. And what do I mean by this? Well, the bad news is that we live in a broken world. We do live in a broken world. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean simply, this world we live in is not heaven. It's not heaven. I mean, it's good, right? Blessings abound in this world, but it's not heaven. It's not yet the, the complete fulfillment of God's plan for his children. An eternal residence in which, as we're told by God in the prophecies of the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible, in 21.4, it says this. It says, he shall wipe every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. So I start with this this morning in to, to recognize that as incredible as the world is in which we live, it's not yet that which God has planned to emerge in the future. I mean, I have to admit, I look forward to that day when there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain. I mean, don't you? It's going to be incredible. We're not quite there yet. We're not in the new heaven and the new earth or the new Jerusalem sometimes as the, as the Bible refers to it. So we, as followers of the Son of God, followers of Jesus, we're to keep this in mind whenever we assess the things of this world. When we ask questions like, why do bad things happen to good people? Why are there plagues and diseases? Why so much death and destruction? I mean, just this week, why are there hurricanes and typhoons? Jeanette and Toby, y'all have to explain to me. They're from the Philippines. I don't know the difference between a hurricane and a typhoon. So I'll, uh, I know they're similar. But anyway, there was both this week. I, it's because we live in a time in which we can refer to as this. It's in between already and the not yet. And yeah, I took that one from the author. We live in a time between already and not yet. In Romans 8, Romans 8, 18 to 39, the Apostle Paul describes life on earth as a, as a time in which there is simply is brokenness. There's suffering. And he states this in Romans 8, 22. He says, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So even in that statement, we see, yeah, it's painful. There's suffering in the world. You experience it, I experience it. Certainly this week, we saw examples of it. But childbirth, what, the pain that means there's something beautiful coming. In other words, this world is not, yeah, easy for me to say as a man, I know, but uh, in other words, this world is not functioning in such a manner that God would look at earth and say, this is exactly how I would desire the world to be, with people living exactly as I've directed. We're not there. But followers of Jesus, we have the opportunity to reveal to the world what God does desire. And sometimes we do that, and sometimes we don't. Yet that being said, there's always hope. For one of the verses you and I are hold to just hold tight to is a couple of verses before in Romans 8, 18. Paul says this as God speaks through him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so why am I starting with this this morning? <clears throat> because this morning we're to consider one of the most beautiful wonderful manners of expressing love with which we have been gifted, and that, of course, is sex. And yet we're well aware that this expression of love has been tainted in such a way as to kind of concurrently be a catalyst for some of the most sordid, abusive, exploitive, misused, and destructive influences really throughout the globe. 
And so from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 6, I want us to consider three points that I believe God is, uh, is, is giving to you and me that deals both with the brokenness of the world and also the gift of sex. And simply put, we see in this passage that what we do with our bodies matters. What we do with our bodies matters. It matters to God. It matters to others. Each and every one of our actions is an opportunity to glorify God or not. One of the foundational questions to consider is whether you and I choose to live to please and glorify ourselves or to please and glorify God, which, let's face it, can be especially difficult when the two seem to be in contrast. Truly trusting that God knows and has communicated that which is best. What determines that which I do and that which I don't do? You know, particularly if I'm considering that which I may desire to do, which seems to be in contrast with what, what God has revealed that he wants me to do. So Paul is writing to the Christians in Corinth, and these words are timeless, so God is writing to us today saying, in essence, <clears throat> Well, in that particular culture, he was saying this, what's going on? What is going on? Do you think that because God is gracious, because God is forgiving, that because Christ died for your sins, that you can do whatever you want? I mean, is that how you express your thanks to God for the offering of his son? I mean, it's as though saying, in fact, I think Paul puts it in one of his ways, are, are you saying you want to sin greatly so that grace can abound? It's as though you're saying, hey, Jesus took care of the penalty for my bad behavior, so I'm good to go. If I do what's wrong, I just make him look really good. And so we pick this up at 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12, where Paul at least implies, he's implying, let's say you're right. Let's say that you can do anything, everything, that because of Jesus' atonement, anything is permitted. He states this, he says this. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So we see here that even good things become bad things when they become ruling things. Even good things become bad things when they become ruling things. When Paul quotes the saying, well, I have the right to do anything, he's not affirming that principle, but he's speaking to an attitude that was prevalent around him in the city of Corinth at that time. It was kind of a combo package of Las Vegas and New Orleans put together. And it's as, if, it's as if he's saying, for the sake of argument, let's assume you're right for a moment. Even if you have the right to do anything, not everything is beneficial. The problem is not fundamentally a problem of law or rules, but a problem of mastery. We cannot control our fickle hearts. And so many things that we may convince ourselves we're free to do are not things that are beneficial to us or to those around us. Sex is one in a list of whole catalog of good things that can become bad things when they become ruling things. I mean, it's kind of like the popular saying, you are what you eat. In verses 12 and 13, Paul's addressing an attitude that essentially denied that the things people did with their bodies had any impact on their souls on a practical but and we fundamental know level, the food we put in our bodies matters. It determines the amount of energy and even health that we'll experience. I know I mentioned this one before, y'all know there's, there's a Dairy Queen, right? Going in just down the street, right? Just a little ways. Blessing and curse. I've said it before, I'm among those who look forward to the completion. I mean, I can't wait. And, and that's the problem. Too often, when I think about a peanut buster parfait, I just can't wait. And it's funny how our mind manipulates things. And this one's kind of lighthearted and maybe ha-ha, but lots of things that's not so funny. I mean, I'll go to the Dairy Queen or, uh, oh, 
<clears throat> when I was out with Pastor Edinson and Jair, did y'all know this in Hamilton? Some of you probably know this. There's kind of a mom and pop Dairy Queen type place called Flubs. Y'all, f- f- somebody, yeah. Yeah, Flubs. Go to Flubs. So they're super nice people. And, um, well, yeah, it's funny how I even say that. See, I justify the peanut butter parfait, which is kind of big, because I'll get the small hot fed sundae and just put Spanish peanuts on it. And so, but it's funny when I told the, the woman taking my order at Flubs, okay, small hot fed sundae, pa- Spanish peanuts. I love Dairy Queen peanut butter parfaits. You know, she's like, well, here you go. And I'm like, whoa. And isn't it funny how even then you're like, I shouldn't eat all that. I shouldn't eat all that. But one thing leads to another and, and boom, it's gone. I mean, you know how it is. It happens with all kinds of things, with food, with drink. I mean, from I'd like a glass of wine to I need a glass of wine, or I'd like a beer to I need a beer or three. You know how that goes. Maybe not. Good if you don't. Um, How many times have you heard it said, I know I shouldn't eat this, but what happens? Good things become bad things when they become ruling things. And the same way, The things that we do with our bodies profoundly affect our relationship with the Lord. If, as the Bible says, we're not our own, if we're not our own but the Lord's, then the things we do with our bodies matter. God has given us the gift of sex, and we like that. But this gift comes with parameters and guidelines and limitations for our own good because God loves us. And I know today it's even controversial, but the the scriptures tell us it's to be within the marriage relationship. It's between a man and a woman. It's not to be promoted for exploitation or for random pleasure. But we don't like the limitations and the restrictions, the guidelines, because we like to do what we like to do. And so we have to pay special attention to the things that have the potential to rule our hearts. Sex is one area where I most powerfully and practically reveal what truly reveals, rules my heart. Now, it's interesting as we consider that, how good things can become bad things if they become ruling things in a destructive way. The next verse Paul says is this. He says, and God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. It's funny, as I read this, I'm thinking, okay, so Paul's kind of doing this, you know, this birds and the bees thing, and then all of a sudden, I don't, you know, it's like, I mean, I can relate, it's like, oh man, I'm feeling kind of nervous, awkward, oh, and God raised the Lord, uh, and also raised us up by his power, it's like, what in the world, what, where did that sentence come from, and here's what I'd say, Paul's reminding us that we are hardwired for eternity, we're hardwired for eternity. And the, you know, this little sentence might seem out of place in the middle of the discussion about food and sex and bodies. But Paul reminds his audience that God raised Jesus from the dead and will also do the same for believers. And there's an important connection here. Instead of living for momentary pleasures, what we do with our bodies must be viewed in light of eternity. A core issue in the sexual struggle is our tendency to treat a particular moment of life as if it's all there is, that's all we have. And let's face it, I realize in the midst of growing up and hormones and all the activities of life, it's incredibly difficult perhaps to truly stop and say, wait, I'm designed for eternity and I need to keep that in mind even in sexual expression." You know, C.S. Lewis, he put it this way. He struggled, he described this struggle in this way. Who would have thought C.S. Lewis? If y'all read any of his stuff, I mean, kind of, really kind of a a really conservative kind of British kind of guy. He says this, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. He says it's like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he simply cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We're far too easily pleased. You might say that you and I, as we live in this life, we have to fight eternity amnesia. Eternity amnesia. That we're living for eternity. Rather than living as those who have hearts 
minds and purpose set on eternity. Let's face it, we're surrounded with a consumer culture that says now, get it now. I mean, it happens continuously. Apple comes out with a new iPhone, what happens? The line is around the block, right? And I'm casting no stones at anybody, but the line's around the block because I gotta have it. Here's one that came to mind, Mercedes or Tesla comes out with a more affordable model. Huh? I mean, am I the only one that thinks, hmm, I want, I want that. Or the next Avengers movie comes out. I got to see it now. I've been there, done that. And there's excitement in that which is new. It's not in and of itself evil. That which is desired, that which brings pleasure. I want it now. But with sexual desires, God's designed us to keep eternity in mind. Not just a moment of pleasure. And keeping a perspective on eternity is not easy. We're continuously faced with decision points. Do I believe God has communicated through the scriptures that which is truly best for me? And if I do believe that, and that's a huge if, which is so often rejected, but if I do believe that God loves me and he has communicated through the scriptures that which is best for me, then will I submit to God's ways, to God's directives, over my desires. I mean, let's face it, there is surrender, there is sacrifice of self-desires when you follow Jesus. And we have to consciously choose to evaluate the condition of our hearts with more than just a rule book or a, or a standard to meet, but rather in light of eternity. Our sexual lives are meant to be protected by the long view of life. And so finally, the Apostle Paul goes on this way. He says in verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Key verse there. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. I mean, this is deep stuff. It says you, as a follower of Jesus, have been united with Christ to be chosen for a higher purpose. In fact, theologically, Old Testament, we thought of the temple as the temple in Jerusalem. And that's where God would be present in a special way at the Ark of the Covenant in a special manifestation. New Testament, the temple is now our bodies, that God resides in us. And verse 15 tells us something incredible. We are united with Christ. I mean, it's not just some ambiguous spiritual reality, but it's, it's a physical one as well. When you receive God's gift of forgiveness and salvation through Jesus, all of what makes you, you has now been united to Christ. And so the metaphor that Paul uses in these verses, as he talks about, you know, uniting your body with a prostitute, uh, it's, in, it's intended to be shocking because we're not to be complacent of our understanding of the significance of this unity. It matters more than we can possibly know. And this unity is not without purpose or cause. It's not just unity, I mean, it's, it's ownership. Paul's making it clear that not everything is beneficial. And this is true because we aren't making decisions based on momentary personal desires. He's saying your body has been chosen for a higher purpose than anything you had ever planned or even your ability to imagine. God Almighty and the power and glory of his spirit has moved in. And then this passage ends with two commands in light of all this. It says, so worship God with your body, glorify God with your body and flee from sexual immorality. I mean, that's pretty heavy stuff. The spirit of God living in you or me. 
The author, Paul David Tripp, he explains it this way. He says, a new landlord has moved in and taken over the management of the building. He's claimed the building for his purposes. And we know when new management moves in, we have some folks here who have apartment buildings that they rent out. And when you come in sometimes when someone else has owned a building, you do cosmetic things on the outside, but you're also changing uh, the vision, the operating philosophy, and the purpose that motivates its work. <clears throat> and so let me ask you this morning, when it comes to sex... Are you embracing your higher calling? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. You and I were not our own. We're bought with a price. And so glorify God with your body. I urge you this morning to seek out the higher calling. And I know sometimes we can say these things. They kind of get lost into the yeah, 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 whatever. But God is calling us to seek out the higher calling for which you've been chosen. I mean, the truth really kind of feels like a heavy weight of responsibility because I recognize certainly in young people's circles and really all adult circles, this, is, this sort of thinking is not embraced today. And the reality is God is the one who calls you to it and he's also the source of your ability to fulfill this calling. God will equip and empower and sustain us. And just as your salvation was a work of grace, this higher calling is only possible because of God's grace. You know, Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 6 are a, they're a sharp critique of an attitude that flows underneath our sexual sin. And that is, I can do whatever I want with my body. But instead, the Lord reminds us that we're called to view our bodies in light of an eternity and in the context of the new owner, God himself. So may you and I glorify God with our bodies. As we wrap this up in prayer, I want to share with you just briefly, as I thought about this topic today, I guess my vision, my hope for us as Bethany and Esperanza Viva, who we would be as a people when it comes particularly the area of love and romance and sexual relationships. Here's, here's my hope. That we would be a people who honor the marriage relationship between a man and a woman that we would be a people who encourage and honor young people who choose to wait to engage in sex until marriage. And that we would be a people who extend grace to those young and old who have not. That we'd be a people who have the maturity and trust to provide a culture where we may confess to one another. Where those who are gripped by the luring pull of pornography or other temptations, you and I know this isn't something that's experienced outside of Bethany, it's us. That we'd be a people, that those men who are struggling, or women, that you'd have a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ, that you could say, can I share with you? Will you help me? Will you walk with me? Will you hold me accountable? That we'd be a people where those who are struggling in marriage may find guidance to seek reconciliation and repair. And may we be a people who will actively fight. And I don't know exactly what this is going to look like, but God just put it on the heart, not just of me, but others, but that we would actively fight against the hellacious growth of the sex slave industry. We, we cannot passively sit by as much as I have been and would like to be. We have got to become active and fighting against this, because it's not foreign to our nation either. May we surrender to our own temporary pleasures in light of eternity. Help us, Lord Jesus, right? We, we really don't stand a chance apart from him, but with him, all things, all things are possible. So let's pray, let's pray. And today I just, I pray you just be transparent before the Lord as he loves us and he blesses us and wants to shape us. Let's pray. God, as we come before you today, Lord, again, we thank you for this, this life you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you've poured out to us, the things that help us live, the air we breathe, the food we eat. Lord, this morning, we especially thank you for that that special relationship, that eros love, the expression of, of sexual intimacy. Lord, I pray that as we, as we acknowledge the blessing of this gift and we receive it, I pray you would help us to live 
and be and do what according to your ways and so Lord I, I particularly lift up the younger generation and ask that you would just guard and protect them Lord and I pray Lord those of us of other generations that we would glorify you help us Lord Jesus to be the people you'd have us be and Lord, today, where I know this, this good thing is taken and so often it's exploited, Lord, I pray that you would help, help men here to come together and to hold one another accountable to, be, to live in purity of life according to the way you would have us do so. And certainly the same with women as well. And Lord, I pray that show us the ways that we can be active to combat evil when it comes to the area of, of sex and this whole industry that's come up, Lord, not just in our nation, but in the world. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you and to be ready to move and do and be according to what you're directing us. And so today, Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much. I thank you that you love us so. We're not in heaven yet, Lord. But help us to live as a people who have our sights on heaven, who live for eternity, trusting in you and live to your glory. Jesus, for your forgiveness, for your sacrifice, for lifting us up, Lord, when we're down, we give you thanks and praise. I pray these things in your holy name.